Welcome back to Night After Night's Top 5 Lists of Laverne and Shirley episodes, folks. And this, unfortunately, is where things get weird. As the newbie here on the podcast, the move to California was not something I grew up knowing about, and the shift is something I'm still coming to grips with. After the rather bumpy ride getting through Season 6, on first viewing I found Season 7 to be a much more balanced experience, with a consistent director, more focused writing, and generally a lot of okay episodes that worked. Initially, I thought, alright, this is far better. Then time went on, and the more I thought about the season, the harder it was to nail down a top 5 list. There's a lot of maybes in this one. Moving in feels really damn close to even a top three slot, but there's that something missing, and the Frank and Shirley awkwardness just doesn't gel for me. Love is the Tar Pits has an incredible guest character, but its setup and resolution is done so quickly that for me it almost borders on non-existent, despite the powerful and thoughtful acting work put into the episode. Not at the awards has its problems for me, but it sticks the landing pretty smoothly. Even other ones, such as Watch the Fur Fly, I Do I Don't, Rocky Ragu, they all have fantastic highlight moments, but never enough to make me say, oh yeah, that's a number 4 or 5 spot for sure. Even worse, when it came to finishing the writing for this video, I wasn't sure if my 4 and 5 spots were the same as they were before. Then it shifted twice more after that, sliding Love as the Tar Pits out and putting Moving In there, but then feeling as if Moving In wasn't as enjoyable to me as my number 5 spot, and then pushing my number 5 to number 4, and I started to wonder, could I even do a top 5? Was it even possible? But given that I have watched Season 8, I had to come up with something positive before it all comes down. So, with that in mind, we're going to be a little atypical here, just as Lisa was in her list for this season. And with that very belabored introduction, let's jump into my top five for the seventh season of Laverne and Shirley and see what the hell I can scrounge out of this slapstick and heartfelt mess. How would you feel if I moved out? It was only a dream. No. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. You take requests? Oh, yes, I certainly do. Get out of there! <laughs> oh, I love violence. <laughs> But uh, if you expect to be a professional wrestler, you have to know how to take a fall. Yeah. Ah! Yeah, I just got in. I was over at your place. I wasn't there. I know that, Len. I talked to Squiggy. Ah, uh, did he tell you I wasn't there, too? Yeah, that's solved. Anyone can have a broken camera. I'm a journalist. I need proof. You get me a photograph, you get me a tape recording of Johnny Velvet doing something really ugly. What is season seven to me? In a word, experimental. But not always successfully. The writing staff has stabilized, Yet it often doesn't have the impact of the heart that made the earlier seasons so pleasurable. And man, there's some fantastic guest actors in this season. But too often they're in episodes that come back to simplistic plots or gags and sometimes don't even just have much for them to do. Because of this, I can't say for certain what my number 5 is in a top 5 for season 7. I mean, at least not anymore. But I can at least say this. It's likely, depending on the day, one of the following. Rocky Ragu. He won't lay a glove on me! <laughs> Moving in. <laughs> Love is the Tar Pits. My name is uh, Leonard Kosnowski, by the way. Hi. One ski. Oh. <laughs> Karen Caldwell. One well. Night at the Awards. She said it was a comedy. She said it was a comedy. We're dramatical writers, not comedy writers. Watch the Fur Fly. I only speak English and I don't do that so good. Well. <laughs> Well, what? Uh... Well, I uh, figured that out when you told Mr. Dubois to keep his elephant outside. Or Star Peepers. As the producers tell me what to do, now you're telling me what to do. I can't take it anymore! Now, if you want my further thoughts on those episodes, we have plenty of podcasts that you could listen to. But the thing that's consistent throughout all of them is a sense of fun, which elevates them above the usual sitcom dreck that commonly clogged the airwaves during the era. I mean, you've got young Jeff Goldblum as one of the better boyfriends and dates that Laverne has had. There's a boxing movie gag where Carmine's combining all of his talents in one episode. We get to watch Lenny fall in love with a cool gal and experience a deep heartbreak. Laverne gets an episode where she lives out a 70s relationship drama with Paul Sands and did a little bit of bonus Levenny tease. There's the girls getting to take on the tabloid bullshit that affected their real life, while also featuring fantastic guest spots from both Harry Shearer and Harry Dean Stanton. And Joey Heatherton nearly kicks the boys in the face while they also finish their first screenplay. These episodes are all damn close, but none of them reach above the line enough to say, Huzzah, I'm your number five, buddy. And I know, this is going to be a cop-out, and for that I apologize. I know, I'm a terrible and bad person for it. But you know what? That just makes me the defiant one. 
Another adult with impeccable taste in literature. Here, take it. Read it again. I don't. Get what about that part where the mean owner beats Black Beauty? I cried. How about you? Oh, yeah. Buckets. Buckets. You know something? I'll bet you'd enjoy my friend Flicka. Not quite as powerful, but a classic in its own right. I like Flicka. <laughs> Beat it. Combining screwball comedy with crime picture is one of the highlights of Laverne and Shirley's blue-collar shenanigans. And here it comes to fruition with Richard Mall's perfect Sterling Hayden-style bad guy. Combined with Cindy Williams' well-meaning but tense performance as Shirley, it creates an energy that is kept from scene one to the last frame. The defiant one brings back the zany and the put-on-a-show attitudes of the Milwaukee years, giving the whole thing a theatricality and verve that just jolts the system. It starts off with a hilariously impressive physical comedy bit from Penny Marshall and returning guest actor Archie Hahn, who himself was an early member of the Groundlings and had appeared in season two. From there, the tone of the episode is set. Once the other unwillingly tethered couple takes off, it's chases, dirty alleys with graffiti, playfully over-the-top characters, and Chekhov's toaster. I would like one order of ribs for my friend and an order of chicken with extra barbecue sauce for me. I want that chicken dripping with extra barbecue sauce for me. You got that? Thanks. Because if that chicken dripping with extra barbecue sauce doesn't get here soon, I'm going to die. Bye. <laughs> Using Shirley's love of animals as the gateway while also showing her craftiness throughout her attempts at escaping her captor highlights one of the sparks the character gets to have in Season 7. Cheryl's thinking, more internal, and while sometimes a klutz, she's clearly capable of taking care of herself. Getting into the situation was a big mistake, but she manages the chaos with admirable spunk. Oh, it's good to be home. It makes the connection she shares with this Louis Armstrong that much more satisfying, where she twists seamlessly from appealing to his better nature and undermining his escape. And yes, Laverne's presence in the episode is mostly just for the comedic window dressing and the fantastic memorable slapstick. The fact that she's the one who recognizes something's wrong when Shirley places an order for something very specific at Cowboy Bills indicates that the girl's sisterhood is alive and well in this madcap episode. Yeah, you know what I'm gonna make this punk. Watch that punk stuff, Pops. Watch that pop stuff, punk. I would just like to take a moment here to point out to you the size of this man's hands. Probably three times the size of his brain. I'm gonna punch you, old man. Take your best shot, punk! Richard Maul is one of the season's best guest stars. And given how good Jeff Goldblum, Paul Sands, Harry Dean Stan, and Harry Shearer are in this season, that is saying something. Now, Maul's a few years before he'd end up becoming Bull Shannon, but his performance is like a chunk of tough jerky. He plays the old-time crook that would have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Dana Andrews, Ralph Meeker, Sterling Hayden, or William Holden, but all done with the comedy chops and knowing smirks that show the dynamite dramedy actor will come to know him as. With a quick scene from Rhonda being the desperate starlet and Frank saving the day in protective I'm Shirley's pop now punk mode, the whole thing blends into a delightful screwball comedy. It's not as deep as some of the better episodes of the season, but it finds its way into my top five. Ah, uh, gee, uh, well, I guess I can tell you we haven't released it to the trades yet or anything, but uh, we just signed ourselves a clown. Oh, wow. A clown, that's right. Your own business. Mm -hmm. Your own clown. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dad, I got some business to do. I'd love you to see me do business. What do you say, huh? Great. I'd love to see my little tycoon in action. <laughs> Let it be known that David Lander is the secret weapon of Laverne and Shirley. Michael McKeon gets a ton of the flashier parts of the first six seasons, such as the sullen romantic and the understanding beating heart of the boys' dynamic, and thus is by no means less. But Lander has, for almost every single season, come out swinging with a total surprise for me, and Helmet Weekend is perhaps his finest work in the show, possibly even surmounting the subtle dark humor of Testing Testing and the heartbreak of Duke of Squigman. Another Roger Garrett script, one of the many boy-centric episodes he's credited for, its inevitable drama goes far deeper than I expected. We know this is going to go wrong, that Squiggy's absentee father is going to come sniffing for money, that he's going to weasel his way into the company, then rob Peter to pay Paul before a adios to his little Andrew. But when the moment hits, the realization dawns on Squiggy in a way that is so human, it snaps you back from the sitcom silly into these characters being people. And as said before, the work Lander here does is pretty incredible. One of his best qualities is the humanity that he gives to his characters, no matter their morals or standards. Here, Squiggy is not just a sleazy agent. He is a broken-hearted child reaching out one last time for daddy's love, and finally standing up for himself as a man. More than that, realizing how far he's actually come in the family tree. 
Uh, okay, your grandfather. I mean, he was a bootlegger, right? Uh, his father was a, uh, was a pirate. pirate. Yeah. Pirate, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing that you came out as good as you did. What also makes this one stand out as a Lenny and Squiggy episode is how it plays off the duo's relationship. Lenny's used to be in a doorstop for a lot of people, but the way that he uses this meekness to let Squiggy figure out for himself that his dad's a bum and not to be trusted is honestly, I find, a stellar touch. Because it shows him being smart and believing his best friend will see the truth in time. Because eventually he will reach his lowest point and the truth will come out, and that's when Squiggy's gonna really need him the most. It allows both actors to do the subtle performance work where they need to. Glances, what is and isn't said, how it's said. I'm curious how much workshopping this was for the director and the talent, and how much of this was just David and Michael knowing what to do and going for it. As well, sadly, it's the last time we'll see this level of broship between the two for the whole show. But what a whopper to go out on. Let me take a look at you. 20 years, it's been a long time. How do I look, Dad? How do I look? Definitely 20 years old. Oh, I've been working out there. I've been working out there. <laughs> great, great. I am proud. <laughs> Uh-oh, hands off, fruitcake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Back off. <laughs> the wonderful father and son moment is happening here. Wynn Irwin's performance as Helmet is spectacular, showing the root of so many of Squiggy's quirks, both the good and especially the bad, while also making him his own distinct personality, and how he turns on the right amount of charm that makes him slimy but magnetically charismatic. It's no wonder that not only have people gotten sick of his crap, but Squiggy still wants to believe that his dad is here to rescue him, to take him far away from the poverty he knows he's in, and to go off to some happily ever after as father and son. It makes the emotional fisticuffs of the finale all the stronger. When Squiggy finally stands up for himself, calls Helmet out, and practically disowns him, it's a tragic victory, but one whose burn is soothed by the fact that the blood of the Covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And so, Lenny and Squiggy are once again Squignowski Talent Agency of Burbank. Stab. And what was the shocking truth at Twin Kitchen? The entire Bobblenick family was about to get tangled in a web of lies. Lies that would wind their way down a path paved with sin, deception, and murder. I had heard there was a soap opera parody episode of Laverne and Shirley, but I had no idea it would be this freaking good. Dream scenes are easily one of the best parts of Laverne and Shirley, be they of the futurist or theological or cinematic variety. And the fact we get two episodes dedicated to fantastical imaginings is an absolute treasure in season seven. With Perfidy in Blue, we see Shirley imagine a guilt-laden dream full of backstabs and makeouts. Allowing the cast to dive into wild takes on the stereotypes of soap operas brings delightful comedy full of more vaudevillian weirdness and winking references at every turn. With Sidney Williams and Penny Marshall both getting to play rival femme fatales, Lander as a hoity-toity spoiled brat, McKean in an affair patsy part, and the uh, interesting combination of pancake magnate and sexy French maid for Phil Foster and Leslie Easterbrook. I'm so happy, you're so happy. I'm so happy, you're so happy, I'm so happy. That makes four of us. What an idiot. Everything from the costumes to the set dressing to the organist comes together in this madcap treasure of an episode, one that will probably make even just passing fans of comedy, parody, and soap operas get a sensible chuckle or a big belly laugh. It once again allows the staging, choreographing, and visuals of the season to take on a new personality, which season 7 does regularly and confidently. You get a sense that this is a party and everyone's having a blast. I also really marvel at the fact that it's one of the most consistent episodes of the season, something which I found to be a rarity on rewatching season 7 this past year. And it's treats like these that do make the later seasons of Laverne and Shirley worth trying. Because for every In Affair to Forget or Ski Show, you get to have tons of face smashing, weird twists, slapstick bordering on cartoonish, and some of the best dialogue that a sitcom has ever had. No problem. Just bring her our new improved dose of with hexachlorophene. Yes. It's a stronger, more effective knockout. And it fights cavities. Why, you're right. The Dosacoma group came up with 27% fewer cavities. Another of Season 7's highlights overall is the fact that it's trying to make you laugh, it's trying to have fun, and while some efforts are more successful than others, Perfidy and Blue is up there in the must-see episodes of the entire series because of it. It's always got something new to throw at you, be it the commercials influencing the dream during the drugstore scene, or the detail of Luann's earrings containing the Dosacoma poison. But I've already put gas in the Cadillac. 
Well, suck it out of the caddy and put it in the Etzel. But, dear... Leonardo, I have died for you. The least you can do is suck a little gas for me. And like any good parody, it gets wackier and wackier until the climax gives the big, shocking reveal. In this case, a very, ugh, reveal. And it never loses an ounce of its energy, even as it barrels towards the final moments of Shirley's awakening. I had a feeling this one would be fun, but like Upstairs, Downstairs, and Born Too Late Before It, it exceeded my expectations. It might have perfidy in the name, but there's no deception this episode's earnest comedy. When I asked you to sing a song for me down at my second anniversary of Cowboy Bills, I expected you to sing a nice song. Not a song where your pants was on fire. Woo, 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 woo. It's like your fire went out a long time ago. Hey, hey. Little joke. Huh. Easily the best time I had in season 7 was an episode that I was actually taken aback by. A silly vignette of various musical numbers, comedic sketches, and a nice little Carmine and Frank wraparound that gives the whole proceeding a little bit of father-son bonding banter. It surprised me to come out of it smiling so hard, partly I think because even though I enjoyed the 7th season more than the tumultuous 6, well, there was something often lacking in its creativity, and most of all its execution. I think now what I describe it as is that extra oomph, but here, that's entertainment's got that oomph, and then some. While disparate and of varying depth, each segment has a particular gimmick that makes it come to life. The way Leslie Easterbrook's rendition of Blue Moon goes from the traditional croon to the playful Marvelettes rock and roll, back to the smokier take that's almost a bit like Ella Fitzgerald's version. Or how the vaudevillian comedy goes through the motions of its gags almost like an assembly line, to the point that it adds to the deadpan delivery. Oh, and the spoken interludes and call the police applying that extra touch of lineage squigginess, despite it being staged and shot like an old variety show performance on Ed Sullivan. And I mean, everything about the operette. Like, seriously, everything. Okay, but don't say I warn you, I'm the fencing champ of France. You didn't tell me he was the champ? Sorry. Another case of everyone having way too much damn fun making the show together, and bringing the audience in on every joke, every wink, and every artful expression. There was passion in front of and behind the camera here that brought back the energy of seasons prior. Even down to Phil Foster getting to do an old routine with Cindy Williams, Carmine's Tom Jones impersonation, and the cinematographer getting to do a classic mirror gag during the tap dance sequence. Director Gary Mentier, himself a dancer and performer in the 1960s, adds a layer of creativity across the whole thing. And if you look this guy up, some of his performances, including the waiter bit in Hello Dolly, yes, that one, show that this fella had the juice. And his experience goes right into his director instincts throughout this episode. Thus, it sings, dances, and rim shots its way into my heart. The fact that he was also responsible for the extremely fun and underrated Child's Play episode that concluded season six, and almost concluded the whole show, is of no surprise to me. But you know, the two of us, we've never been able to make such distinguishments. I like that word, Thank man. you very much, I knew you would. With its physical performances firing on all cylinders, the comedic timing and in-character personality on point in every segment, and the subversions of trope along with loving throwbacks to entertainment of yesteryear, this is easily one of the best parts of the Laverne and Shirley move to California, and one that practically makes the entire upheaval of the show worth it, especially if they had kept figuring out inventive ways to utilize it like this. Oh, nurse! Would you pick that up, please? <laughs> Thank you. Remind me to do that four times a day. Whether as a highlight of a good season, or just a one-off gag, if someone were going to watch only a single outing of each Laverne and Shirley season, this would be my season 7 pick. Hands down. Ultimately, this seventh season of Laverne and Shirley is one that I have fond memories of, even if I can't feel them quite as deeply as I used to. There's enough here that while I still would have preferred the series to have ended with season 5, the highlights have made the California years mostly worth it. There's highlights, even in the lesser episodes, even the worst episodes of the season. And even with disappointments like the return to Milwaukee and the reunion episode, the nonsensical weirdness of Charles Grodin, and the lack of any Lenny and Squiggy on set making their own schlock movie episodes, uh, it still works. It still really works. And look, I could go back and forth on this for ages. Heck, I probably will for the rest of my days. In a sense, it's like the first Resident Evil movie of Laverne and Shirley seasons. There's a lot that bugs me, but there's also some good filmmaking in there, and I can't throw that out, and there's a few moments that make me smile. Okay, to be fair, I like the season more than the first Resident Evil movie. Vanessa, don't hurt me. Anyway, with this done, we'll be starting our podcast episodes for season 8 in the next couple of weeks. And I mean, can't be that bad. Can it? <laughs>